Welcome to the Wealth is in the Details podcast. In this podcast, financial planner Peter Raskin helps families and business owners understand and prepare for their wealth journey. Along the way, thoughtful and detailed planning can provide clarity and confidence as clients confront a multitude of financial decisions. Listen in as Peter shares stories and insight into people's wealth journeys. Now, let's get into today's podcast. Hello and welcome to Wealth is in the Details with Peter Raskin from Raskin Planning Group. Today, we're going to be talking about a lot about Social Security, and I'm excited to get into this. And we're talking about data in some way, shape, or form, right, Peter? Yeah, we right. are. All right. So what, what are we specifically, what are we talking about with data? Well, I think the, the issue is for when I, when I hear a lot of our clients talk about the information they've received, either in the media or talking to friends, I think there's a, a, a bit of a disconnect between mm. data uh, and information and the reality of financial planning. Yeah. And I, I know a lot of people think that financial planning is about basically about predicting the future. Uh, and I know that people like to use data, especially, you know, number of crunchers, they like to use data to kind of see trends and, and all this other stuff. But really, I, I don't think that's that effective. How does comprehensive planning deal with all the uncertainty? Great question. It's, and it's one that the financial planning industry is, is I think, struggled with, uh, at least getting the message across to our clients that, that planning isn't trying to predict the future. Mm -hmm. we're, we're really not in the prediction game. And frankly, that's because we, we really don't know what's going to happen. We, we just don't have crystal balls. Yeah, exactly. So what we're trying to do is to, is to map out kind of a, a plan with reasonable projections, not, not predictions, but projections based on what we all consider reasonable assumptions. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that the that, that that planning organization that has this longer term perspective and, and experience of working with literally hundreds of clients can really tr truly help clients build these appropriate plans with reasonable assumptions because they've seen it before. Yeah. And so, so I think it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's human nature to try to put this, put order into chaos. So as we're thinking about uh, where, where clients are, their situation, they often feel that there's, there's just not the clarity that they want to see. Mm -hmm. So they, they try to connect data points that reach conclusions that might help resolve problems. And sometimes the conclusions are reached before there are conclusive data points. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we call this a confirmation bias. Uh, I've talked about this in, in previous podcasts around behavioral finance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that goes into a little bit more detail. But basically, if, if we have a preconceived notion about something, uh, for example, a company makes a great product, makes us feel good. Uh, the recent stock performance suggests that it's a great stock to own. And therefore, that recent performance confirms our good feelings about the company and the stock. And that's the, w that's the reason you decide to purchase that stock based on those feelings. And so that's, that to me is called confirmation bias, where you're using data that isn't really consequential to the long-term results of that stock. Uh, so I think it's an important discussion because we all want to feel confident in our plans. We want to make sure there's clarity that, that, we're, that we're feeling good about reaching our goals. And our focus on these data points that confirms conclusions we want or, or we that we believe uh, are, are, are there aren't always so helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Today, I'll give you some examples of discussions with clients and uh, you know, we can, we, we'll discuss why the data uh, may or may not help reach goals. Uh, some of the examples are going to be on, on planning issues that we've talked about in previous podcasts and some are going to be focused on, on the client investment experience. Got it. I do, I do, before we get into it, I really want to stress that there aren't any dumb questions or comments from the people we're talking to, our clients. Um, it, it, so they, if they, they may have a question about a certain uh, fact that they've heard, and that's all reasonable. It's, it, people should ask good questions. We just don't want to use all of those, that, those supposed facts and data to help us 
uh, meet all of our our uh, planning goals and objectives because it, it just may not be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think everybody listening to this at one time or another has seen something, a post on Facebook, post on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter or somewhere, uh, or just mainstream news that they look at, they're like, wow, that's, that's an interesting fact or, man, that, that's really inter- interesting information. But there's that kind of that twinge in the back of their mind. Do I trust it as true or not? And who has time to investigate all the data that's thrown at us all the time? So, Peter, I love what you've done here uh, for the audience. Peter's really given me an outline of the questions and statements that that clients have asked. And I'm going to ask him and he's going to give the answer and, and the discussion they had. Ready, Peter? I'm ready. All right, let's start with the first example. Social security is expected to run out of money in 2035. That's what I've heard, at least. I don't think it'll be there for me. Yeah, Eric, even if there were no adjustments or, or tax increases, I really do believe social security will, will be there for our clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, benefits may be less than currently projected, or taxes may actually be higher than, than currently projected. That all depends upon what Congress and, uh, and, and, the, and, and a president uh, decide. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now, Social Security is projected to have enough revenue to pay 80% of benefits. And it's projected that, that if Congress does nothing, there'll be enough benefits to pay uh, Social Security recipients at least through 2090. 2090. Oh, 2090. It's a much better number. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so with that in mind, um, we feel like including social security in, in projections is, is, is important. And it's a, and for most of our clients, social security is really a meaningful benefit. Mm-hmm. And if we project, um, if we project no social security benefits, it's really going to affect their planning dramatically. So yeah. we do want to we do project in our assumptions a, a slightly lower inflation rate than we might project other expenses, and we're trying to be conservative, but we don't think it's reasonable to expect nothing because mm-hmm. that's not that's not how the current structure of Social Security works. And the other thing is that there are so many boomers, uh, what is it, ten thousand a day that are they're becoming senior citizens. That's a huge voter base. I don't know any congressperson that doesn't want to get reelected. <laughs> they're going to make sure that that's there because that's a whole lot of voters that'll get them out of office if they're not working toward fixing the situation. Yeah, so. I agree. I think um, Congress is eventually going to uh, look at this, and the sooner they they begin to to uh, correct it, uh, the better off everyone will be. Mm-hmm. And I think it'll be a mix of um, of increased taxes, uh, lower benefits, lower inflation. And I agree with you 100 percent that 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 the currently uh, the retire the, the population that's retiring over this generation that's retiring is likely not to see great great uh, a great effect. Uh, it's the next generation that will probably see slightly lower benefits and mm-hmm. higher taxes. Mm-hmm. All right, on to our next example. Uh, I've heard the average stay in long term care facilities is about two and a half years. Therefore, the financial risk of long-term care to me or my family really isn't that dramatic. I'll probably only need care for less than three years if I need it at all, Peter. Yeah, I often hear this fact and and and, and really find it to be um, a, a really useless data point, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah. uh, the reason being is, is that, that average is meaningful for the insurance company, for an insurance company that, that is insuring long-term care. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're pretty comfortable knowing that on average they should expect to pay out a certain amount of money to reimburse a family for claims, but that's over over thousands and thousands of individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, but an individual and a f- individual family needs to look at this really differently. They need to ask the question: What's my potential liability, and am I willing to self-insure that potential cost, uh, or? Do I want to pool my risk with lots of other individuals and 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 have a potentially much lower cost of long term long term care? Mm-hmm. So it's fine to talk about averages, but how is that going to affect your family in the event of a long term care event? Yeah, and and let me just give a, a personal story. Uh, my my mother's mother, my grandmother, was in a long term care facility for over twelve years. Mm, wow. 
my father's mother was in a long-term care facility for only about two months. Got it. So the average stay in a long-term care facility for my grandmother's was 73 months or, or, or six, six years. Mm. And that's far longer than the two and a half year average. Oh, yeah. So while I think the statistic of two and a half years average stay in a, in a facility is interesting, it doesn't really help the, the individual understand the, the financial risk that they, they possibly could confront. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Next one is your next example is I can make decisions today that have long-term ramifications based on current tax rates. Yeah, not so fast on this one. You know, tax rates have changed dramatically over the years. They've gone up and down. And this is over, you know, 100 years. Mm -hmm. And and I predict they will continue to do so. It's just reasonable to assume today's rates when we're doing planning, but we really don't know how they're going to play out in the future. Yeah. So I just, we just don't want to make any, any big decisions based on what might happen. So just as an example, I have a client that made a very large gift to, to family members, uh, thinking the estate tax might increase. And while it was a good strategy, it's, it was an expensive strategy to implement. It was complicated. Mm-hmm. And it really hasn't resulted in the promised benefits. And frankly, it really wasn't worth the effort and the legal cost. So he made a decision based on what he thought tax rates were going to be. And they turned out different. And it was a, a costly mistake. He, he, he got advice from an accountant that rushed him into a strategy that just wasn't necessary. Gotcha. That's no good. All right, Peter, our next example. My parents both died younger than age 80. Shouldn't I plan for a shorter life expectancy? Because that, that seems to be the trend in my family. Yeah, I hear this often. And, and I'm not sure where it comes from. But, you know, it's much easier to meet your retirement income goals if you expect to live only, you know, 15 or 20 years after retirement compared to living 30 or 35 years after retirement. Yeah. You'll just need less money if you expect a shorter life expectancy. So, you know, I, I tell clients all the time that genetics certainly can, genetics can certainly make a difference. If your family has a longer than average life expectancy, you might have a better chance of living longer. But there's just no guarantee that you have inherited all the good or bad genes. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, I will say that this generation, and I think future generations of affluent clients are, are living healthier lifestyles than, than, than they were in the past. And medical care and technology is much improved compared to previous generations. So, you know, I, I don't think everyone's going to get to 100. Uh, but I think it's reasonable to, to think, you know, maybe early to mid mid nineties is, is a, is a strong possibility and and you should plan for that. And, um, if you've planned for that and, uh, and, and something happens sooner, then you're, you're just, you're leaving more assets for the next generation. And, uh, it's just a good hedge. Mm -hmm. So next example you've got here, Peter, uh, really talks about stocks and bonds. So some of my stocks, bonds, or funds have negative returns so far this year, should I get out of those funds that are negative? Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> um, again, I hear this often. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- when you have a, a, a diversified portfolio that that consists of lots of different kinds of, of stocks or bonds or funds, uh, your portfolio is just always going to include holdings that are doing better than others. And that's the magic of, of diversification. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, we're, we're not placing... Uh, bets on one stock or stock fund or one one part of the market. Uh, when we diversify, we're, we're we're just we're certain about one thing, which is we just don't know the future. Yeah. So we want to include assets that um, aren't correlated, meaning they do different things at different times. So as we mix these assets together, thinking uh, think about uh, baking a cake and adding ingredients into a mixing bowl. Uh, we actually improve our chances of a, of having the kind of experience that we we want from our our portfolio. Mm-hmm. So you know, just always remember when you're seeing these um, 
holdings that have negative experience in a short period of time, that um, a diversified portfolio, which is a, the prudent way to, to build a portfolio, is bound to disappoint. Because some parts of it are going to be doing well and other parts will be underperforming the better performing parts. So gotcha. it's just, it's, it's what you should have. Um, not every asset class or stock or bond or fund is going to be positive in every single uh, measuring period. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's a, that's a pretty hard expectation to hit. Yeah. It's impossible. Yep. <laughs> it just right. doesn't happen. Yeah. All right. Which leads us right into the next one. Peter, I want to see the rate of return for each asset I own. Yeah, again, this is just this is uh, again around diversification. If 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 we want to reduce volatility or risk, uh, we want to include lots of different asset classes, and we we want to diversify. Mm -hmm. So um, we know that we're going to always be di disappointed in some of our holdings. And my point around this is that we aren't necessarily concerned about the performance of one security or one fund, what we want to do is to make sure this, this whole portfolio is, is meeting our objectives. Uh, are we taking the appropriate amount of risk? Are we getting the income that we need or want? Uh, as we look forward, is this portfolio helping me meet my long-term objectives? And if we try to look at each individual asset on its own, and, and try to judge the rate of return on that asset to, to determine whether it should or shouldn't be in our portfolio, we're really missing the mark. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's diversification uh, is vital, and uh, it, it, it means that we don't necessarily need to dissect the whole portfolio to make sure that we're doing well. Yeah. All right. Next example. I track my accounts daily, monthly, quarterly to make sure I am on target to meet my goals. Sounds like a good idea, Peter. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> uh, and it really does. And, it, and it's, it's kind of a rational way to, to, to think about it. You know, we put together a long-term plan. We're showing um, assets uh, growing, hopefully, over time. And so a lot of our clients might want to track their actual portfolio to the plan that we put in place. Mm -hmm. And they do that by looking at it on a regular basis. And I would say if if all rates of returns were going up at the same amount each and every day, quarter, year, then that would be not an unreasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. But but in reality, portfolios jump all over the place. Yeah. Um, w this is now the uh, toward the uh, later part of August uh, 2019, and we've seen tremendous volatility. In, in, in past weeks. And uh, that doesn't mean that what we own uh, isn't appropriate or necessary to help us meet our goals. It just means we're seeing some volatility now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we may have negative performance in any, again, day, month, or quarter, or even year. And that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that your, uh, your portfolio is on track. Yeah. It, it's really not the way to gauge it. We have to think more over market cycles. Uh, that helps us think about this as a, as a, as a marathon, a long-term marathon, as opposed to a, um, a short-term event. Yeah. And for most of our clients, they're, they're, more, they're thinking long-term. And anything that is short-term, meaning they might need... Uh, cash or liquidity in, over the next 6 to 12 to 18 months, we're making sure those assets are in very safe and conservative, no risk or very low risk accounts yeah. so they can access them when they need it. But the long-term money, geez, we just don't want to be looking at it uh, on, a, on a regular basis and tracking our performance and our, our journey. It just, it's not helpful. Yeah, it could drive you bananas. Drives you bananas, exactly. Right. <laughs> All right, this next one I really like because I've heard a lot about indexes lately, especially you know on, on TV, and I should probably stop watching so much of that, but my portfolio isn't beating the market, Peter. Should I own an index? Well, we hear this as well. Um, the interesting thing is uh, that, that your portfolio may not beating, 
may not be beating uh, the market, but that depends upon what market we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, many of our clients compare their portfolio to a widely discussed index, uh, like the Dow Jones Industrial Average mm -hmm. or the Standard & Poor's uh, 500 Stock Index. Um, and, and that's really not helpful only because the portfolios that, that we're helping our clients with are often globally diversified in large company stocks, small company stocks, international stocks, uh, U.S. bonds, non-U.S. bonds. They're, they're, they're not necessarily built like those indices. Mm -hmm. So is, is your portfolio beating, uh, beating a market or an index? It may not be because that's not how you're investing. So um, the key here is to understand exactly what your portfolio is made up of. And then choosing a, a, a benchmark to see if your portfolio is, is, is doing well relative to that benchmark or that, that basket of indices. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think it's necessary, necessary to, help, to beat an index to, to beat to meet your goals got it you know you, the index that you choose might be more aggressive than you will are willing or should um experience it's all individual so, yeah it's all individual everyone everyone works differently got it. Uh, sometimes um many of our portfolios include index funds that are are trying to replicate the performance of the S and P five hundred, or mm -hmm. or the uh, an international uh, uh, stock index or bond index, and we're we're we we might include a portion of it in that index or a portion of it in in another index, but your portfolio is going to be much more diversified than just a sole index. Yeah, absolutely. All right, switching gears a little bit, Peter. I have a job. Isn't that great? And I have a 401k plan. <laughs> so my plan is I'm given a list of 20 funds within my 401k plan. I review the funds every couple of years and choose the funds that have the best historical rates of return. What do you think? It is just not the way to choose a portfolio that's appropriate. Um, you, you, you probably heard uh, that past performance is, uh, does not suggest yep. future performance. Yep. It certainly doesn't guarantee it. Uh, moreover, most most 401k plans that we are are working with that we see are uh, are offering a menu of funds that would include uh, a, some large cap stock funds, some small cap stock funds, international, uh, some cer certain kinds of bonds, and just because a fund has very good performance over the last 12 months, 36 months, or even five years, doesn't mean that that one fund is going to have the best performance going forward. Mm -hmm. And so th just one fund or two funds doesn't necessarily give you diversification, the diversification that you want. So certain, in a period of time, international stocks may, may outperform domestic stocks, U.S. stocks. So we don't want to include... Uh, we don't want our portfolio to be 100% invested in, in international stocks. That would be uh, a bit more risk than we might be willing to accept. Yeah. So we want to diversify and we want to, uh, we want to use many of those funds that are very good. We don't think historical rates of return are the best way to judge performance going forward. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of being on a freeway. And there's three lanes. You're in the middle one. And yours is the slowest. The other two lanes are going much faster. And then the minute you switch over to the faster lane, it starts to slow down. In the middle lane you were in, all of a sudden, 10, 15 cars pass you. Oh, yeah. You're always right behind, you know, that was doing good a few minutes ago. So now it should still be doing good. It's just not a, yeah, it doesn't seem like a good way to, to invest. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. All right. Here's another one that I've heard. I've heard a ton. Um, Peter, we haven't had a recession in more than 10 years. So we're due. It's got to it's be coming soon, right? Well, um, I've heard it as well. And <clears throat> we, don't, we just don't really know when a recession is going to come. 
I will say that that the economy is cyclical. Mm -hmm. uh, it it just it never goes up forever. It never it never goes down forever. Just like the stock market it never goes up forever. It never goes down forever. So uh, if we accept the fact that it is cyclical, that we are going to have recessions, and recessions are really a, a, a slowdown or a shrinkage of the economy, that doesn't mean we're all out of business. It just means the, the, the economy as a whole isn't growing as quickly as it, it, it was uh, compared to other periods. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have not had a recession in many, many years, over 10 years, and that's, that's been great. Whether the next recession will be here shortly or for in, in another 10 years, I really don't know. I, I will say that, um, that, that we try to do planning and, and make recommendations around portfolio risk with the, assumptions, uh, the assumption that a recession is always right there in front of us, that it could happen at any point in time. And that if it does happen, if a recession does take place, it's likely that the stock market might have some contraction as well. We might see negative returns for mm -hmm. a period of time. And so we just have to, we, the way I think about it is we have to always plan for volatility in the equity markets and recessions do affect the equity markets. Recessions affect the bond markets as well. Yeah, And so... We, we just don't know when it's going to take place. We have to plan for it like it's coming tomorrow, but it's not because we're predicting it. Got it. Now, and some people have heard this term before, and, and probably a lot of people haven't, so you're probably going to need to explain it, but um, an inverted yield curve. So doesn't an inverted yield curve mean a recession is likely to come sooner rather than later? Yeah, Eric. Um, many of our clients are asking about this inverted yield curve. And, and what it actually means. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but, but suffice it to say that this, this graph attempts to chart the yields of, of uh, U.S. Treasury bonds. Okay. And when, 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 the, when short-term yields are um, higher than long-term yields on U.S. Treasuries, many economists uh, see that a recession is coming sooner than later. Uh, and they they see that they say that because uh, over the over recent history over the last forty fifty years uh, when there's an inversion to the, this yield curve when short term bond uh, yields are higher than long term yields a recession can uh, often comes next mm -hmm. but next means it could come in the next uh, you know three months six months eighteen months or even later yeah we. But we talked about that previously. We, we said that recessions are cyclical. They come. <laughs> we yeah. can't avoid them. Uh, and, and the inverted yield curve is, is just a, an indicator of interest rates and, and, and how bond investors feel about future rates. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the, there's a recession coming tomorrow. We don't know the extent of that recession. Uh, we've had recessions without an inverted yield curve. And for ex not every country... Uh, in the world, experiences recessions after after uh, experiencing an inverted yield curve. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it's an indication. It's something to talk about. But uh, that unto itself, that data point isn't necessary. Doesn't necessarily mean one thing or another. It doesn't help you meet your objectives. With that information, it doesn't tell us that we should move out of the stock market or move into the bond market or change our the portfolio. Remember what I, I suggested earlier that we think a well-designed portfolio is one that uh, accepts that recessions and market volatility are just part of uh, the, the investment world today mm -hmm. and that we always have to prepare for that. So whether we've seen um, yield curves uh, that are inverted or not, uh, always prepare for volatility, always build your portfolio around that. If your goals change, then we need to change your investment portfolio to meet yeah. that that uh, new objective, or that that if your risk tolerance changes and uh, you're you're unable or unwilling to accept additional risk, we might want to reduce uh, your your exposure to riskier assets. But that's that's the only time that we make changes based upon these these kinds of data points. Yeah, I mean, it, 
let's face it, the guy standing on the corner that says, hey, there's a storm coming, but doesn't tell you the time frame. He's right. Exactly. <laughs> He's, he is absolutely <laughs> right. There is a storm coming. Uh, just don't know when. So, yeah. All right, Peter. We, we don't know when, but we also don't know where it's going to hit. Exactly. So we hear that. We hear that all the time. Oh, thunderstorms, rain. Well, you know, in in my town, it may be raining, and we might have thunderstorms. But it's three towns over. It may be. It may be clear. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, Peter. This is great. I love being able to put myself in the position of your clients that are asking these questions. And you're absolutely right. There are no dumb questions. We're we're inundated with so much information that it's hard to decipher. So I, I love the fact that you gave your clients a voice in this podcast. And uh, if somebody is is listening to this saying, you know what, I'd, I'd love to get into more of a discussion about A, B, or C, whatever it is, how do they reach out to you and, and get a hold of you? Well, they can certainly call my direct line. At, that number is 617-728-7433. Or they can email me at peter.raskin at lfg.com. Perfect. Thank you so much, Peter. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Speak to you soon. All right. And thank you all for listening to the Wealth is in the Details podcast with Peter Raskin. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Peter comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thanks so much for listening today. For everyone at Raskin Planning Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wealth is in the Details podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Peter Raskin is a registered representative of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Securities offered through Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker, dealer, member SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Sagemark Consulting, a division of Lincoln Financial Advisors, a registered investment advisor. Insurance offered through Lincoln Affiliates and other fine companies. Raskin Planning Group is not an affiliate of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation and its representatives do not provide legal or tax advice. You may want to consult a legal or tax advisor regarding any legal or tax information as it relates to your personal circumstances.